This morning, I want to complete the sermon I started Sunday night. Uh, It's about the hidden treasures of God in the parables. I'm going through uh, the parables of Jesus, not all of them on Sunday evenings, but this one uh, struck a chord, and I wasn't able to finish it Sunday night, but I want to uh, finish it with you. So I've got to give you a little background for those that weren't here uh, last Sunday night. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. I have scriptures coming up, but I'm going to read some more scriptures before that. Uh, Luke 9, 23 says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. I've been in Christianity all my life. My dad was a minister, is a minister, uh, retired now, but uh, I was saved at age five. And uh, I, I always say from the muck and mire of sin at age five. What kind of, what kind of trouble can a five-year-old get into? Well, have you raised any toddlers lately? We can get up. But I do say that to let us know it doesn't matter what our background is and how far into sin we were, we're all in need of a Savior, and his name is Jesus. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Verse 45, a second parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Those are some, I don't know about you, if you ever thought about these parables, but they're a little strange, right? Um, What does man value today? I would say cryptocurrency, <laughs> uh, money, check, checking accounts, uh, stocks and bonds. Maybe uh, for many of us, we're looking at that retirement account. And uh, some have to plan out. You say, you know what, if I live past 95, I'm going to need some help, right? I don't know if you plan. And as uh, inflation increases, we, got, we have more to worry about, right? But we don't need to worry. What does it profit a man, the Bible says, to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What does it profit a man to gain all this but lose his own soul? So what are you passionate about? What do you care about? What's most important to you? Uh, John 18, 36, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. This is not the full expression of God's kingdom. He said it's not of this world. It's With Jesus, we got a spiritual glimpse of the kingdom, but not a physical. Remember, the disciples were looking for him to set up his kingdom right there physically, but it was a spiritual one. Jesus said, uh, when he taught the disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Entering the kingdom is free but it cost us everything. We talk about the free, uh, the free gift of salvation, and um, it is free, but it takes all we are to pursue it. Psalm 49, 6 through 8 says, Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, For the redemption of their souls is costly. So let's look at uh, the parable of the hidden treasure. This guy finds a treasure in someone's field. Apparently he's been hired possibly to plant a garden or to to do some type of work, maybe a field of wheat, whatever. He's working and he comes across this treasure in the field and it says that he hid it. He buried it back. And he sold all that he had so he could buy it. Remember, this is a parable. Jesus is speaking a parable uh, 
for us to understand what he's talking about. He's not talking about literal money. He's not talking about the guy in California that found over $10 million worth of gold coins from the 1800s and uh, cashed that in. Wouldn't that be great in your backyard? You're digging, you know, every once in a while we'll have a uh, squirrel or something die at our house and, uh, and I have to bury it. And I'm digging, I'm burying this, and I come across this can of, you know, or this big wad of money, right? I don't have to rebury it. That's mine. It's in my yard. But back then, if, it, if you didn't own that field, it wasn't yours. But he realized because he found it and he had been hired by the landowner, the landowner probably didn't know it was there either. So he buried it and he takes all his money, cashes sells everything he has so he can buy that land because he knows that treasure is there. That's the kingdom of God. When we know what God has for us, we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. We give up all this for that. We give up all the world has to offer because it is the most precious gift that he's ever given. It is more, it's worth more than anything you can imagine. I don't know if you want to trade your salvation for the temporary pleasures of this world. Many people do. It's crazy what they give up. They give up eternal life so they can have momentary pleasure. We see it with uh, church people. We see it with the world today. They'll give it all up to go after something. They'll give up their family to chase some, uh, to have an affair. They'll give up their livelihood to go after drugs and alcohol, and some give up uh, all they have for fame that is fleeting. But I want to bring out a few points to you about this. Number one, the spiritual kingdom in Jesus is the most valuable thing in the world, and although we can't buy it, we must give everything up to pursue it. What did Jesus say? Not my will, but yours be done. Lord, not what I desire, what do you desire? The most miserable place for you and I is to be out of the will of God, to be somewhere where he hasn't called us to be. When I, uh, let me give you a little bit of my background. I told you I was raised by a minister, my brother, three years older, was already in ministry, and my dad came to me my senior year and said, son, we lived in Springfield, Missouri at the time, son, let's, uh, let's go and sign you up for Central Bible College, CBC. And I said, no, I want to go to Evangel. Now, Evangel's not a bad place, all right? My, brother's, my older brother's now the president there, but... Uh, Back then, you had the liberal college and you had CBC. You had the, uh, CBC was the minister's college and Evangel was a little more, uh, you're, it's a Christian college, but you can do what you want. I, I, I felt like, because my dad was a minister, my brother was a minister, that all I was doing was following their footsteps and that little rebellion came out. It wasn't too much, but you know what? I'm not gonna do it. I, I, I just felt like it I was doing it because they were. Went to Evangel for one year. My dad got a job here at Southeastern, and the opportunity arose, do I stay in the frozen tundra of Springfield, Missouri, or do I move to Lakeland, Florida? And I, I left a, a young lady I was dating there in Missouri because, hey, Florida, come on, you guys moved here, right? Most of you. The second thing, I could go to school for free. And they offered the same degree I was looking for, which was education, all right? Moving on, I graduate college. I get a job at Kathleen High School to teach history, my favorite subject. I walk across, I walk onto that campus that first morning and the Lord says, what are you doing here? Come on, God, I just spent four years studying and all, it, he told, I just felt it. As Raphael mentioned, you feel that in your spirit like you felt, we felt today, the presence of the Lord. I felt God say, 
you're in the wrong place. Three years later, I got things turned around. It wasn't that I was out of the will of God. I taught 16 years in public school, off and on, off and on. But I wasn't in the place that God wanted me to be. And if I would have stuck it out and stayed there, I'd be most miserable. But I said, Lord, I'll answer your call. I'll do what you call me to do. It's, it's the most peaceful, no matter how tumultuous it is to live for God, it is the most peaceful place you can be. Amen. Ask any missionary on the wall, and we have missionaries here, former missionaries. They will tell you, I'd rather be on the field doing what God called me to do than sitting at home doing something else because that's where God wants me at that time. That is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a realm where Christ graciously rules over and eternally blesses willing, loving subjects who embrace him as Lord of all. The kingdom also consists of everything that is eternal, everything that is true, that has true value. The Bible says all things will pass away. The things of this world. Our countries, nations, rulers, kings, all these will pass away, but his kingdom will remain forever. God's kingdom is a heavenly treasure lying in a field of a poverty-stricken, bankrupt, cursed world. His treasure is here to find. He has brought, God brought Jesus to earth so we might find his kingdom. And it's, why, you know, have you ever thought, why would God give all that up to save us? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever calls on his name shall have everlasting life. So the kingdom is spiritual. Number two, the kingdom is not easily seen. It's not easily visible. God isn't hiding it from us, but he wants us to go after. He wants us to seek him. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. There's no large billboards announcing, take the next exit to the kingdom of God. It's not like Disney World, right? There's no... Uh, flashing lights and advertisements on TV. Here's the kingdom of God. He doesn't want to make it difficult for us to find him, but he wants us to pursue him with all we are. The lesson here is they, these, these folks were, they weren't real, some were seeking the kingdom, some were not. And they found the true treasure and went after it. John 1 verse 10 says, He was in the world and as the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Non-believers can't understand why we worship God. A non-believer sitting here today would say, why in the world are they lifting their hands? Why are they praising God? Why do they get so emotional? It's because they can't see. It's not visible. And it's not that God, God is hiding. God wants, he, he wants us to hunger for Him, to have all of Him. Um, Many ask, why would you, uh, growing up, I had friends that say, you're a goody two-shoes, right? Have you ever been caught? I don't know if that's even a, kids don't even know what that means today. And to prove them wrong, because I, to me, that was a bad label. I didn't want that label, but that's what they saw, which later on I realized that was a great testimony, right? Oh no, not to a 13-year-old boy who wants to impress his buddies, so... So we started playing some cards and, um, in band one afternoon. Oh, I thought, well, I'm going to show them I'm not a goody two-shoes. I'm going to cheat. 
So I palmed a, if I, I stole an ace in the next hand, and you know, you're supposed to put them all back, and I put it under my leg, and I thought, okay, when the time comes, you know, and I can use that, I'll win the hand, right? Uh, so I, I did it, faked it, pulled it out, won the hand, and then I told them right after I cheated. No, they wouldn't even believe me I cheated. <laughs> I love my wife with all my heart. She's in there watching the grandbaby again, all right? I don't want to hurt her. So there are, th there are things I n will never do because I don't want to hurt her. I love my God with all my heart. And I don't want to do things that hurt the Heavenly Father, that hurt my God. The world today, we, they go after the thing. We, you know, the man's heart is evil. We go after those things, but God has changed our hearts so we might please him and do what blesses him. I, don't, um, I do not willfully sin because I don't want to break the heart of God. But the Bible says if we do sin, he will forgive us and cleanse us if we confess it. Number three, the kingdom is received personally. In other words, I can't receive the kingdom of God for you and vice versa. I can't be saved just because my grandparents, my parents, my brothers and sisters are saved. I'm saved because I have said, Lord, forgive me, cleanse me, make me brand new. Have you ever asked Jesus to be Lord of your life? I pray you have, because you have to ask. You can't let someone ask for you. It is individually received. Number four, the kingdom of God is a true source of, of joy, real joy. Matthew 13, 44, it says, it was for joy that the man went and sold everything in order to buy the field with the buried treasure. It's for joy that he sold everything he had so he could have that precious treasure that God had for him. It is a joyful thing when someone comes and gives their heart to Jesus. Amen. They give up, they, you know what, what are they giving up? They're giving up the crud of this world to receive the most precious gift that ever was. That's why the angels rejoice in heaven. It is joy, it is joy to know the Lord. Uh, in John 15, Jesus said that I am the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse 11, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. That's, uh, we sing that song, Full of Joy right? It's unspeakable and full of joy. Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. There's just a peace and a presence of God. There's just a, we, sometimes we relate joy to being happy and laughing all the time. That's not true joy. True joy is a satisfaction of knowing my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm headed to a heavenly kingdom. The kingdom is a source of true joy. Joy is the natural result of appropriating such a treasure for yourself. Number five, not everyone comes to God to find the kingdom by the same way. The parable of the buried treasure shows this guy was not looking for treasure. He just stumbled upon it and found it. The Apostle Paul was not looking for God. He thought he was following God. And God, it was Saul at the time, shone a great light and struck him down on the road to Damascus and changed his life forever. The Samaritan woman at the well was minding her own business, in fact, trying to just sort of 
stay away from everybody else. She went out at uh, a later time when she thought no one else would go to the well. Jesus showed up to give her great joy. The Ethio, uh, those sought God, or those were not looking, but found God. The others sought after God. The parable of the pearl of great price, the man was seeking valuable riches. We have a few examples. The Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 was searching the Scriptures, trying to find. He said, I don't understand. And Philip came alongside and said, what's wrong? He said, I don't understand this. Can you explain the Scripture to me? And he showed him the Scripture and he said, well, hey, there's a lot of water here. Let me get baptized. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius was seeking God, praying and giving to the poor And God answered his prayer because he was going after God. There are different ways to find him. What's your story? What happened with you? Did did you were you like me and just grew up in the church and gave your heart in kids' church? (laughs) Or did you get miserable with your life? Say, you know what, there's something better out there. I need to find it. And you seek and you find. Doesn't matter how we come to know him, he wants to give it. Give his kingdom to everyone. But we must receive it. We must receive it. The last one. We pay a high price for our salvation. I think this, we miss this point in Christianity because we say it's free. It is free. It is a free gift. In fact, let me read to you Acts chapter 2 verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We can't earn his salvation. I can't be good enough to receive it. I can't pay God enough. We don't pay our tithe and give to the church so we can earn our salvation. We give out a love because we recognize where all our gifts come from, but we receive it by faith. The problem is we don't want to give everything else up. We want the salvation that God has to offer, but we want to continue to live the way we always have. We want the blessings of God. We want Him to heal our bodies. We want Him to touch and minister to us. We want Him to bless our finances. We want all these things, but we don't want to give anything up. It, picture yourself as a missionary called. We have them here this morning. I can name, I see at least six here There's probably more. Um, They're called of God. They they have a life here in America. They give it all up so they can go overseas so they can give it themselves. And it costs a lot. For many of them, it costs family. It costs their livelihoods. We have missionary families over the years that many have died on the field. Many have been killed. Take, put in prison, and you name it. Give it all up. But here in America, we give our heart to Jesus, and we just keep going with life. We never change. We still do what we've always done. What do, what do we really have? We, if it's the greatest treasure that ever was, we give it all up. Now, I'm not advocating we go sell all we have and bring it here and live in one big communal thing. That's not not the point. What I am saying is that, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Not what I want. The, The neat thing about my testimony was when I moved from Evangel College to Southeastern, At the time, Southeastern required 30 hours 
of Bible no matter what your major. You guys know. (laughs) So when I went to go get ministerial credentials, I had already had all the Bible necessary to be ordained. I was ordained in 1992, I think it was. If not, I would have had to go, you know, go back to school, do more work uh, to learn more. But God, in his infinite wisdom, said, you know what? You, you think you're, you're going to avoid this call that I felt called at age 12. Wrote it, my mom wrote it in my school-filled Bible because I went to her at general counsel in Baltimore, Maryland, went down the altar, and I just felt God so strong say, you're called to the ministry. My mom wrote it so nice in my Bible, and I took that Bible and put it on the shelf for about 10 years. (laughs) But God had different plans. God desired all of me. And I'd say, you know what? That four years wasn't a waste. God taught me so much. And God was able to use that in different times in my life where I was able to go back and teach school and find a job and keep food on the table for the family as we ministered. When I came to New Life in 2008, I I taught school for the next five years. I was just part-time. God knew. God knew all those things. I still run into former students today. And uh, one young lady I see at Sam's Club Quite often, she said, what, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm a minister at New Life Assembly." She said, "Oh yeah, wasn't that the church you were at when you were teaching me?" I said, "Yeah, that's the same one." I thought, "Here she is. Six, this is years later, right? <laughs> still remembers, still remembers." But God, it's nothing I can earn or pay. But Lord, I surrender it all. To follow you. So what's God calling us to do this morning? What is he calling you to do? You say, I'm retired. What, what do I do? He wants you to let him guide you, direct you. Take those things out of your life that aren't what he desires. And go after him. We had, like I mentioned earlier, we had a, a lot of people come to the church this week to pray. They gave up some normal things they usually do to come and lay down at an altar and seek the face of God. Are we hungry for God? Do we we want all God has for us? Do we want His presence in our life like never before? I tell you, it, it takes all of us This just comes to mind. If it were just you and I, we'd be okay. We're believers. We're living for God. We're following after God. But it's not about us. It's about everybody around us that needs Jesus. And how are they going to find Him unless we have the presence of God in this place where they want to come and find Him, where they're going to be changed and moved by His power? where they're going to sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit to say, you know what, my life can change if I give it to Jesus. But if we just continue to do what we've always done, we're going to be right where we are, and they're going to die and not know Jesus. The greatest thing we can do is be hungry for Him, to want all He has for us, to seek his kingdom. Luke 14, I'll close with this. Verse 25, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation, he's not able to finish. All who see it uh, begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build 
what was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet who, whoever's coming after him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Today I ask you to count the cost for following Christ. He is worth it. He's worth it all. Where else can we go? Who are you going to call on when you're sick? I fought this cold this week. And I went to the doctor. But who did I call on first? Amen. Who are you going to call when things are not right? We call on God. No one else will be with you in the most, uh, in the midst of the storms of life. No one else but Jesus. Jesus.